Now we do. So let me uh, start uh, again here. When considering the great stories of the Bible, it's with boundless enthusiasm that we examine those specific to the gospel that Christ provided to us. This is one of those lessons because we're going to be looking at the story of Abraham's offering of Isaac, sacrifice of Isaac. Uh, Robin Jensen is a professor of history of the history of Christian worship at Vanderbilt University. University, and she states that from the Constantinian era, era beginning about 312 uh, uh, A.D. until the end of the sixth century, there remain at least 22 catacomb frescoes, approximately 90 sarcophagus reliefs, several important mosaics, and many others referring to the sacrifice of Isaac. There's no way that we can't look at this particular story from the Bible. Uh, one of these sarcophagus reliefs is pretty famous. It is from a uh, Roman uh, senator by the name of uh, Junius Bassus, Junius Bassus, he died while in office. He was given a state uh, burial uh, in Rome. And it's, it's not long after the legalization of Christianity in Rome. He had recently been uh, baptized into Christianity. And uh, his sarcophagus is quite famous. On, I could not find any pictures of the backside of his sarcophagus, so maybe there's nothing there uh, that when he was buried, it was intended to go up against a wall. But on the sides, there is one relief of kids at a, uh, uh, involved in a wheat harvest. On the other side are uh, children involved in a grape harvest. And it is assumed that these were placed on the sides uh, to honor the communion. On the front, there are 10 small panels. The very first one in the upper left-hand corner is a relief of the sacrifice of Isaac. And so uh, of 10 stories, five from the Old Testament, uh, five from the New, one of those includes this particular story. So not only do we have the art, but we also have the differing viewpoints of this particular Bible story. Because when you look at uh, Christianity, um, Christianity has, has its concept. Uh, Judaism has its concept. Islam even has its concept of this particular story. We're not going to spend a lot of time on the Islamic view because <clears throat> what, uh, what Islam has done has removed Isaac and has replaced Isaac with Ishmael. And so in the Islamic uh, uh, idea, uh, they, they come through Ishmael, and so they had to put Ishmael. But there's just, too, there's just way too much evidence that, uh, histor and I want to say historical evidence, that has Isaac in uh, this situation with Abraham. And you'll even see more as to the evidence <clears throat> further uh, along we get. So we're not going to spend a lot of time with the Islamic view. We'll spend just a little bit more time, not that much more, when we, when we uh, look at the Judaistic uh, view of this, because in, in Judaism, this story is called the Akedah. And I don't know if I'm getting the Hebraic uh, pronunciation proper there, um, but anyway, it translates the binding of Isaac, not the sacrifice. In, in Judaism, there are some Jewish scholars, a, a handful as I understand it, that believe that Isaac was in fact burned on this altar. Um, and so uh, there are more Jewish scholars who don't go that route. But in any case, it's a very important uh, story in Judaism because 
as a result of the destruction of the Jewish temple in AD 70, uh, the Jews losing the sacrificial, you know, the sacrifices, the burnt offerings because of the destruction of uh, the temple, the main focus then of worship went to the synagogues. They had to have a sacrifice. The sacrifice that they look to in the synagogues to this day is this story with Isaac. And that's why it's so very important in Judaism. Um, because without this story, they have absolutely no sacrifice by which uh, to worship God. And so that's why they they hold the Akeda, uh, Akeda, however it's pronounced, in high esteem within their system of worship. Christianity, though, we look at this story from a substantiated, and I'm choosing these words purposely, a substantiated historical record. Okay? We look at this story from that perspective. And, and that's the framework that we're going to look at this story for the remainder of our lesson here this morning. And so the Bible shares with us the sacrifice of Isaac and most of all, the faith exhibited by his dad, Abraham. So firstly, we have the story. I hope you have your Bibles open to Genesis chapter 22. If not, please go to Genesis chapter 22. Read along with me. We're just going to look at the first 18 verses here. Read with me now. It came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go yonder. We will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of burnt of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb? For the burnt offering, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Abraham says, here I am a lot. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then, a a then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, uh, this day in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So we have that, uh, that call that came out to Abraham, and as I had mentioned, 
uh, on three separate uh, occasions in this story, we find Abraham saying, here I am. You know, that's a great example for us. You know, when we are called to Christianity, there are things that are not easy within Christianity, but we are still called to do. And each of us should respond in the same manner by saying, here I am. James chapter 1 verse 12 said, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he's been approved, it will receive the, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So all of us, men or women, we have been called to service within Christianity. And like Abraham received his call, we should respond in the same way. Here I am. There is a submission that is seen uh, in this story. And of course, we have that event. And, you know, basically, uh, Abraham's faith is tested. Uh, he is uh, given a task to do, and it is a difficult task that he is called to do, to sacrifice his only son, and, and he's, he has to go to a specific place, uh, which takes three days to get there. He arrives at this place, and, and I, I can't imagine everything that's going through, uh, through his mind that is involved in this. But this is something that I do know, and I want to go back to Genesis chapter 22 to specifically point this out, because it's in verse 5. We're going to re uh, reference this again. But Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder. And this is what Abraham said. I don't know what all was going on in his mind, but this, this is important. We will worship, we will return. I and my son are going there. I and, and my son will return here. Abraham knew that God was going to do something else. Abraham knew that God was going to do something else when he split that wood. Abraham knew that God was going to do something else when he laid that wood on the back of his son. Abraham knew that when he built that altar, tied up his son and placed his son on that wood, fixing to add fire to that wood, Abraham knew the whole time that he was going to return to those two servants, those two men, his two employees, after they were done worshiping. We need to keep that in mind. Let's let's look at some parallels here. Jesus did not have a call per se because what we find in scripture is that uh Jesus knew of his ministry uh before the world even began. Peter records in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 through 21 if you're taking notes there. Uh he says this knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for your sake. God knew, Jesus knew, and the Holy Spirit knew what Jesus was going to do on a mount called Golgotha. John 3.17, God did not send his uh, son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. John chapter 1, verse 29, John points out when he sees Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 11, Luke also records pretty much the same thing in chapter 19, verse 10. The Son of Man has come to save the, uh, that which was lost. What Matthew and Luke record is, is a statement of pre-planning, of premeditation, to use that word. We hear that a lot. Uh, he came to do something specific. 
nothing else. This is why Jesus came to earth, was to seek and save the lost. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 read, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, uh, God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for many, the testimony born at the proper time. And so we find here, although Abraham had a call to do something, to, to go to a specific place, to do a specific thing, for in God's mind, a specific reason, Jesus didn't have the same kind of call. Um, but it was something that he was called to do. And scripture plainly tells us what it was that Jesus was called to do. Jesus also uh, shows us another parallel in here, because as Abraham said three times in our story, here I am, it is a, it is a statement of submission. Um, he is submitting to the call. He's submitting to the act. He's submitting to, to, to the will of God. Uh, Jesus did the same thing. In, in Luke chapter 2, there is a story that we find uh, uh, about Jesus being lost in a caravan, or he's actually not lost in the caravan. His parents just couldn't find him there, and so they went all the way back to Jerusalem. And what did they, what, what did they do? Well, they found him in the temple, and, and he said, Did you not know that I had to be about my father's business? But what Scripture records there for us is a statement of parental submission. Because we find there in that Luke records, Jesus from that day forward submitted to the will of his parents. In Ephesians chapter 6, the first couple of verses here, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Verse 3 tells us what that promise is. I want us to know something here. Children... There isn't a single person in this room that isn't somebody's child. Every one of us here are being told, obey your parents so that you can live a long life. But we also need to understand something else that's being said here. Parents are supposed to parent in the Lord. Parents, if you find that your kids might be disobedient, ask yourself this question. Am I asking my child to do something that God himself would not want me to ask or would not ask of me? If your answer to that is to the negative, then you need to parent differently. Children, if your parents are parenting in the Lord, you are obligated to obey. God is our Father. I think Paul said, uh, let me just run over here to Romans real fast. It's the left-hand page, left-hand column. You have not received a uh, spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Daddy, Father. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 15. We call God our Father. We know He's going to parent us properly, and so we need to, like, I, uh, like Abraham, and even like Isaac, and like Jesus, submit to the will of our Father. Um, Matthew chapter 4, verse uh, 3 and 4, here's just, here's just a few examples of it. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. He answered and said, It's written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. John chapter 6, verse 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Mark 14, verse 36. Of all the examples that we can point to in the life of Christ that 
exemplify the submission, the utter submission that he had to God. It's this. Because in Mark 14, verse 36, this is before the cross. This is, this is on the eve of his, the last part of his life. Uh, probably one of the hardest things he's ever going to have to do. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. You know, Jesus tells a story of a... And I... It's, it's vague in my mind. It, it came up uh, as I was in class today with uh, Bethany and Paul, and, and I don't have the text before me, but it's a story that you're familiar with. You've heard before. So if I get some aspect of it wrong, um, pardon my uh, memory, um, but it's, it's there. You can, you can hunt it down to make whatever corrections are necessary in your studious mind. Jesus tells a story of a father that had two, uh, two sons, and he told them both to go out in the field and work. One said I, said, I will, Father, but never went. The other said, I'm not going to do that, but ended up going. And so Jesus poses the question to the audience, which one did the will of his father? The one who said he would, but didn't, or the one who said he would not, but did? John chapter 14, verse 36, reveals to us that Jesus, in part, was like that son who did not want to go into the field, but did. There are some tasks that we, as the children of God, are called to do that are difficult, and we don't want to do them. But we're good children if we do it anyway. Amen? Uh, if, uh, Bethany, if you and Paul would pass those out for me, those papers that I gave you. Oh, you already did. Okay. Um, so those papers that you, you guys have there, I want to read a passage. Uh, this is from uh, Philippians chapter 2, and, and it says in verses 5 through 9, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Jesus, his name is superior because of, because of his obedience to the cross. That handout that you have, which I did not keep uh, one for myself, um, there is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab yours. Thank you, Donna. We're not going to go through all of the specifics, and the reason that I gave this to you is so that you would have all the texts in which to verify uh, this information here. But this is... This was put together by a brother in Christ by the name of Dr. Larry Petten. He says, There's no clearer picture of the cross and the sacrifice the Father made for us in Christ than, uh, than Genesis chapter 22. Notice the powerful parallels between Isaac and Christ. Isaac is one of the clearest types of Christ in the Old Testament. This story that we have, there are 15 different things. A couple of those we have already talked about here. Uh, one being the submission uh, aspect, because uh, in ver that number 13 on your paper there, both submitted to their father. You know, um, Isaac to Abraham, Abraham to God. And then we have Jesus, his submission to uh, to his father, God. You know, so we, we talked about that. But both fulfilled promises. Both were the only son of their father. Both had a miraculous birth. How old was Abraham when he and Sarah had Isaac, right? Um, both were named before their birth. Both conceptions of these children, Jesus and Isaac, 
were pre-announced. Now think about that for a minute, ladies. Uh, you're not pregnant, but you begin telling everybody, um, by this time, whatever, I'm going to have a child and his or her name is going to be fill in the blank. You know, um, your friends might look at you at the uh, salad lunch or whatever and think you're just banana cakes. You know, you've, you've, you've been spiking the coffee. Um, but that wasn't the case uh, in, in, in these stories. Both were undeserving of their sacrificial death. Both were sacrificed near the, near the same place. When I heard this, I thought, really? I had not known that. So in my studies, I'm looking through, I'm finding my, my maps and all of that, and, and, and you look, Jerusalem's right here, and he's sacrificed right here, and Moriah's right here. You know, it's, they're really close uh, to, uh, to where they were. Um, both had a three-day experience. Uh, both were loved by their fathers. Both were accompanied by two men. You know, the two men went with uh, Abraham and Isaac, and Jesus was sacrificed between Two. And so you have, you have all, all 15 uh, of, of these parallel, parallels there, which, which you have the passages there to be able to verify in your own uh, follow-up studies of our discussion. Uh, well, really not a discussion, but our sermon this morning. So what are some lessons then that we can learn from this? What is our, what, what is our takeaway? All right. Um, how, how, what are some things that we can learn that I think will really benefit our walk with Christ in the world in which we live today? Our communities, our neighborhoods, you know, uh, do y'all have, um, maybe I shouldn't put this, but strange neighbors like, you know, my neighbors, I'm sure think that I'm strange. I was, of course, I deliver mail. I was in my own neighborhood delivering mail. And, and I get a perspective of my house from my neighbor's house, and I'm thinking, wow, I got a lot of work to do. And I, 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 I got some curb appeal problems. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they think the same thing. Sometimes we, we need to have the courage that Isaac had. Isaac was a brave lad. Now, when we say Isaac's son, I don't know how old Isaac was. Some give him an older age. Some give him a younger age. Uh, in the Jewish understanding of the Akedah, uh, they place Isaac as being of an older age and volunteers to be sacrificed. I don't see that because he had to be bound by his father. And, and, and he was bound to such a degree that he was immobile. A Abraham had to pr place his son on top of that pyre, on top of that wood. And so uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. But it doesn't, there's no way that we can take away the courage from uh, from Isaac. Courage is, courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway, said John Wayne. Right? John Wayne, at a point in his career, was afraid of horses. This guy made his living on doing westerns. That speaks a lot there, right? G.K. Chesterton phrased it this way, Courage is almost a contradiction in terms. It means a strong desire to live, taking the form of a readiness to die. Christians are courageous not because of our own power and ability, but because of who it is that we trust, right? <clears throat> who we have faith in. Turn your, turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. 
Because another lesson that we have, and it's closely tied to that of being brave, uh, is, is the idea of faith. Chapter 11 of Hebrews, it starts out by saying, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In other words, when we see what it is that we hope for, we no longer have faith. Put this description in reference to the way that we see Abraham handling the will of God in the sacrifice of his son. Abraham looked ahead to a worship of God that he and his son were going to be involved in, which did not involve the sacrifice of his son. Because what did he tell the people in Genesis chapter 22, verse 5? The two that were waiting below the place of worship, he said, we will return. He no longer had to hope because of his faith. Look at verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he, him, here being God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Let's skip down and read verses 17 and following. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he. Now, I want to stop here for a second because in we have to go back a little bit in Genesis because in Genesis chapter uh, 18, um, Abraham was given the land promise. He was going to be a great nation. You can't be a great nation without a populace. Okay, you go back to Genesis chapter 12 and it's in Genesis chapter 12 where Abraham is given the seed promise, okay? He was, he was going to have a whole lot of people in his family, all right? Uh, and even in our story in Genesis chapter 22, uh, a populace as numerous as the stars of heaven or, or the grains of sand along a seashore. So when it says here, when he was tested, he was, he was being asked to kill the father of the rest of his seed line. One of the things we have to keep in mind, when we have faith in God, God has promised us some things. God doesn't go back on his word. When Abraham believed God in Genesis chapter 12 and in Genesis chapter 18, he takes that belief with him up this Mount Moriah with his son holding on to the fuel, which is supposed to burn him up. And Abraham knows this ain't going to happen. God has promised me, promised me some stuff, and we're coming back. I don't know how he's going to fix the situation, but the situation's going to be fixed. It could even have been, no, I started to say something that's absolutely not true. I'm going to say it so that you know it's not true. So that when someone else says it to you, you can say, no, nah, that's not true. It could have been in Abraham's mind that after he killed Isaac, he and Sarah were going to have another kid. No way, folks. You know why that's not true? Because Scripture at Genesis chapter 22, verse 5, tells us it's not true. Abraham was coming back with Isaac. When we read here, 
He received the promises, offering up his only begotten son. Verse 18, it was he to whom it was said in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. Remember Genesis 12, Genesis 18. He considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead. Maybe the knife would go in to the heart of Isaac. Wasn't going to make a difference. He was coming back with Isaac. Amen? Courage and faith. Those are the lessons that we go home with. I have, I have one more passage to read, and this is from James. <clears throat> it's chapter 2. In, in James chapter 2... Uh, specifically verse 21, he says, Was Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? Yes, Abraham was justified. You see, our faith isn't just faith in and of itself. We have faith in God because of the promises God has offered to us, because of who God is. But we need to take that faith with a little bit of courage to be the obedient children, submissive children that God wants us to be. That's the lesson for you today. So if there's any, 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 anything that you have need of encouragement for maybe maybe you have that uh you have that that thing that you as a child of god want to do but you're just needing that extra bit of encouragement that says yeah you can do this kind of thing um let us give you that encouragement today maybe maybe there is a sin in your life that is just throwing up that huge obstacle uh from from letting you take that next step whatever that step is if you need to if you have sin that you need to confess you know scripture we were in James there's just a couple couple pages you know we turn a couple pages more and and it says there the the effective prayer of a righteous man heals much you know and so if there's any way that we can help you today let us know while we stand and sing there's a fountain free. Tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh haste to its spring. Tis the fountain of love from the source above. And he